welcome everyone. This is uh, one of our continuing CBOC webinar series. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about the return to officiating guidelines that CBOC, of course, in cooperation with Canada Basketball, has built. The guidelines are available on Game Plan, and uh, we hope all of you have had a chance to go in and download the guidelines if you're interested in having a look at them. If you haven't, they will be there, certainly uh, at the end of the meeting and, and as we go forward. Uh, as I move through the presentation, I think there's some things to understand. This is, as you all know, an interesting environment, this COVID-19 environment that we all live in. And even though it feels we've been in it for quite some time, uh, last August, last September, I don't think any of us could have been predicted that we would be sitting here really within weeks of the traditional kickoff of basketball education and basketball games and really have very little idea of the truth of what is really going to happen over the next four months, over the next eight months, particularly in this upcoming season. But like all sports organizations, we're trying to prepare and be ready to return to officiating. Officiating is typically considered, or return to the game itself, is considered phase five of a five-phase plan. It's also important to notice or note that, ah, sorry folks, I'm just delaying. I'm trying to figure out why I'm not able to advance my own slides when I could earlier. There we go. It's important to note that return to officiating is phase five of the national five phase plan. That being said, every province and every provincial health minister, every provincial health officer, and the sports organizations in each province will use slightly different phasing. So here in British Columbia, where I live, they talk about a four phase plan and returning to the court, returning to playing games is actually in phase four. So there are some challenges uh, around how we will look at these things. As I walk through this, the other thing I would ask you to all keep in mind is an open mind and remember that anything that's specific in the plan, I would describe as precisely incorrect in that at this time, it's the best information we have, it's the best knowledge we have, and most importantly, everybody is going to be, have to be prepared for something marginally different in their own area. So let's jump into the presentation. So first off, as we return, referees should be prepared for a change environment and prepared to educate themselves in terms of what they're going to find when they return to a gymnasium or they return to a court. This plan is part of the Canada Basketball Back to Basketball Guidelines. The return to officiating document addresses the safe return and requirements for officials' participation in basketball games. It does not try and cover off COVID-19 protocols. We'll talk about some of those protocols and we'll talk about some of the things that you can anticipate to find when you return to the floor. But in fairness, this is again the best information we have and there's no guarantee that this is what you're going to find as each region will be slightly different. The document provides some guidance around how referees can prepare for a return to competition. And we specify that requirements regarding the safe integration of referees must be in place prior to basketball competition. Another reminder, that the full return to officiating document is available on game plan. So you're being asked to return to the floor. You're being asked to return and officiate a game. What can you anticipate when you go to the gym? Many of the protocols that are developed at the national level are developed through the Canadian Olympic Committee, through Sport Canada, and through national sports organizations. This information is funneled down and presented to the provincial sport territorial organizations, and each of them will modify the plans as they go. We do believe that officials should expect to go through a screening process prior to entering the gym. This may be as simple 
as somebody asking you a few questions. Do you have COVID-19? Have you been diagnosed with COVID-19? Have you been out of the country in the last 14 days? Have you been around somebody who has been diagnosed? It may go as far as actually taking your temperature or doing other screening when you arrive at the gym. You need to be prepared to complete a daily COVID-19 attestation. So this would be a document unless that you would actually provide some history as to whether you have been diagnosed with COVID-19 or if you have, that you're no longer um, uh, considered to, to have COVID-19 or other information about your COVID-19 history. You will also likely be able to ask to sign agreements, which may be waivers and releases related to your participation. We'll spend quite a bit of time tonight talking about the generalities of those waivers and those releases. Referees can expect, as the first two bullets talk about, to attest to their current and recent health as it relates to COVID-19. You may be able, in the you may in the documents, be asked to actually commit to respect the COVID-19 protocols, to actually sign off that you are willing to accept the COVID-19 protocols that you will find in the facility. You'll likely be asked to provide personal information to allow completion of contract tracing. As we say, everybody across the country will face something different. But in British Columbia, where I live today, when you go out to a restaurant, usually one person in your party must leave their name and their phone number so they know who's been at the table, they can contact you if there's an issue and you provide the information for the other people. But when you go into a gym, you're likely to be asked to provide personal information to ensure the facility or the game organizer can complete that contract tracing. You may be asked to complete and sign waivers. There may be a waiver associated directly with the event. There may be a waiver that's provided by the facility. So we could have an organization running an event in a rented facility and both may be seeking waivers and other assumptions or risks to protect various parties from liabilities claims. And you, as a referee, may be asked to waive your rights to make a claim as it relates to COVID-19. In this regard, and we'll talk about this further, make sure that you read all the documents carefully and ensure you understand them before signing them. And remember, you have a choice. Nobody is required to referee. If you decide for health reasons, for safety reasons, or because of the risk involved, there's no requirement for anybody to referee. Let's talk about some of the waivers, releases, and the associated liability. We're asking officials to seek guidance from their provincial or local association before signing any document. If you feel it's necessary, you have the choice and the ability to seek independent legal advice where clarity is not provided by your local association or the province. Make sure that you are familiar with the status of your insurance covered coverage that is offered either through the PTSO in your province or through the PBOA. So in Ontario, the Ontario Association of Basketball Officials has an insurance policy for their officials. At various different levels, insurance coverages are different. There are PTSOs that have canceled their insurance co coverage, so they're not paying for any insurance right now, so there's no insurance in place. There's other PTSOs who have started to bring the insurance policy back as they're preparing for a return to the court, preparing for a return to officiating. However, before they provide insurance for those games, they will want to ensure that these are games that they're sanctioning and the organizers of those games, the owners of the, those games are agreeing to abide by provincial health authority rules and regulations. One of the risks that we see is that many of the waivers are prepared as boilerplate documents to be used by sports organizations nationally. So the Canadian Olympic Committee hired a well-known and large national legal firm to prepare a series of waivers and releases. 
I've seen those documents in the original boilerplate uh, uh, boilerplate setup. They're clearly marked that it, the intent is that the users of the documents, the PTSOs and the organizers should modify those documents to fit the situation that exists in their sport and in their particular circumstance. I can tell you I'm aware of PTSOs that have been using those documents without modification. So as an example, you might be able to, being asked to release yourself from uh, being able to make a liability claim for various perils that just don't exist in a basketball game in an indoor setting. So you may be asked to waive, uh, waive matters related to uh, inclement weather, um, poor field conditions that would be much more applicable to an exterior football game. We continue to work with the PTSOs and work with other organizations to ensure those waivers are amended but we don't have the ability to ensure that happens. The provincial and local associations need to work with the organizers to ensure that they're aware of what officials are going to be asked to sign when they go to a gymnasium. As well, those boilerplate organizations release a number of parties. They may use language like employees, volunteers, uh, trainers, managers, but they likely don't include referees. And we have flagged and talked to provincial presidents about ensuring that the local and provincial associations seek to have officials added as a releasee in those waivers and releases. It is perfectly reasonable that as officials, we're put in the same position as other participants in that we're willing to give up our right to seek a liability claim for something related to COVID, but we should not in any way, shape or form be put in a position of taking on risk that others are not taking on because of those releases. A very important part and something that the local and provincial associations need to be on top of. So you've been asked to referee a game, you're preparing to referee that game. What do we need to know? Under no circumstances, do we want anybody to officiate if you feel unwell or exhibit any COVID-19 symptoms? This is the same condition that your provincial health authorities will be speaking of regularly. You don't go to an office to work if you feel unwell. You don't go to the grocery store if you don't feel well. You don't go to a restaurant if you don't feel well. If you don't feel well, stay home. Do not go out to officiate. All of your game equipment needs to be cleaned sanitized and your uniform is freshly laundered. Under no conditions should you be wearing a uniform that has been previously worn. At all times, anything you're using in the gym, anything you're wearing must be cleaned and sanitized. It is likely that in the early days, dressing rooms and showers will not be available. You're gonna to have to prepare to dress at home and arrive in your uniform. We anticipate that basketball is not going to come back at the youth sports level first. It's going to come back at the youth level. And those people are likely going to be renting those facilities, not the owners of the facilities. And they're likely going to be restricted as to what is available to them. So be prepared to dress at home and arrive in your uniform so that the only thing you do on site is actually change your shoes. You're going to need, your, need to bring your own towel you're going to need to bring your own water or other refreshments in containers that you have sealed and filled at home. Don't anticipate being able to get water on site. You're going to have to take that with you. We would recommend you take some sanitation equipment with you, whether, whether that be hand sanitizer, some alcohol spray, um, whatever it is, but you're going to have to carry your own equipment. Notwithstanding, there should be some on site you need to prepare to look after yourself. Anticipate that in amenities that may have been available in the past, dressing rooms, concessions won't be available. And while we say dress at home, avoid wearing your referee shoes except on the court. On the court. And in the early days, looking to see what your local and provincial health people are saying, referees should not carpool or ride share. You should be traveling to the game 
separately by yourself. And again, we remind people that we don't expect the game to start at the highest levels in the country. We expect it to start on a much more localized level with younger players. When you arrive at the gym or the facility, as referees, as leaders, we need to be able to respect all entry and physical distancing guidelines in place at the facility. And you can anticipate they will be slightly different. One of the things that caught us a little off guard when we started looking at all of these return to play um, programs and principles in various sports is that the arrival and the entry into the facility has generally been shortened and it may be shortened by your provincial and local guidelines. We are encouraging all organizers to admit officials at least 15 minutes prior to game time. The documents that we've seen produced nationally suggest 10 minutes for entry into a facility. We're encouraging 15 to give you ample time to be ready to referee and to be able to do the things you need to do before the game starts. As we've talked, please be prepared to complete the on-site screening requirements. If a dressing room is available, ensure physical distancing practices are followed. So by this, if you are a two-person crew, no more than two people in the dress room if there's adequate physical distancing space, but no visitors allowed in the dress room. And we have asked in our documentation that the organizers provide a safe and secure location for the storage of personal items like keys, phones, etc. That being said, we're asking that you take no unnecessary equipment into the, into the facility. Um, certainly, we have lots of people across the country that carry spare pants, two pairs of spare pants, multiple different jackets because of the various levels we referee at. Please trim down what you take in the facility to the bare minimum. If it's a tournament situation and local associations or provincial uh, associations are going to provide post-game evaluations, as much as possible, those evaluations should occur outside the facility and in a place where you can socially distance. Avoid unnecessary contact with other officials that are in the same facility. So if there are games going on on multiple courts, stick with your partner on your court and the game on your court. Don't expose yourself to more people than you would be exposing yourself to in the normal run of the day. Avoid handshakes, avoid hugs, or any physical contact with your partners or others that you have not seen in a long time. We all understand that not being able to go and officiate has been difficult for many of us. It's been a significant change in our lifestyle. We need to greet our partner, we need to smile, we need to use words of encouragement, but we need to make safety the number one priority and let's not take any sort of a risk that is unnecessary for the game to be played safely. During the game, it's important to understand as referees, you should not be responsible for the enforcement of COVID-19 related protocols. In some of the early materials that we saw distributed, we saw examples of organizers asking referees to take on responsibilities that simply do not fit with our FIBA OBR, the official basketball rules, to take on responsibilities that do not belong with the referees. Responsibility for enforcement of the COVID-19 related protocols belong with the game organizers, with the facility owners, and those that have hired you brought you into referee, not on your shoulders. We're recommending the elimination of the jump ball. This is not a big deal. If the provincial association and local associations decide to continue with the jump ball, that's fine. But if you think about it, that's the only time as a referee, you're actually in close quarters with up to 10 players on the floor and you're in the middle of that situation. Again, this is not a big deal. We've just put it out there and any sort of rule changes that occur should be considered temporary and only in the COVID-19 environment and only 
in all likelihood at the lower levels. We're asking that a minimum of two balls, two balls that are cleaned and sanitized for the game be made available. And those balls should be switched out at each timeout and interval of play to be cleaned and sanitized by a designated table official. This is something that we're asking of organizers to ensure they have a minimum of two balls and they're cleaned and sanitized by a designated table official and the officials can swap them out. Officials may make small adjustments to mechanics and procedures in order to reduce the number of whistles in the game. And this would be whistles in close proximity to others. So as an example, we might eliminate the whistle at the start of quarters or the whistle that we use to activate teams to come out of timeouts. If we do have a jump ball, we can eliminate the whistle before the jump ball or the whistle on a front court and line throw in. So we all know that if we have a throw in on the front court end line, we're gonna have a whistle to start that play by our FIBA mechanics. This would be an example of a whistle we could take out of the game. And for those that haven't made the transition, this is a great opportunity to work on the bounce pass mechanic for all free throws so we're not standing in close proximity to players and we avoid as much of the unrestricted uh, distancing as we possibly can. These are just examples of small changes that could be made, but they're things that we've identified that we can do to avoid spittle coming out of the whistle and potentially either infecting someone close to you or getting on someone. During the game, try and use your voice instead of the whistle in dead ball periods. We should be doing this mechanically anyways. What a great opportunity. Let's keep our whistle sharp, clear and crisp, but not too long. Practice social distancing when it is appropriate to do so. As we talked earlier, refrain from shaking hands, fist bumps, high fives with players, coaches, table officials. And practice yourself refraining from unnecessary touching of your face, eyes, nose and mouth, particularly during the game. For many of us, myself included, this would be a huge challenge. As we get into a game, we, we build up and we get a little bit of a sweat going on. Avoid contact with others not directly involved in the game. So you have 10 players on the court. Those are the people that you're going to be involved in contact with. They'll change, they'll substitute, but we try and reduce it to a small number of people as we can. Critical, prior to going out and starting the game, wash your hands. At halftime, go and wash your hands. And after the game, go and immediately wash your hands and after the game and before leaving the gym. Ensure that you know who's responsible for health and safety protocols and use that person as necessary. So if there is something that is clearly something that should be avoided through health and safety protocols and raises a concern with you, know who the responsible person is for addressing it. As we've said, you should not take on responsibility for enforcing COVID-19 protocols. But have fun. We should all be excited to get out on the floor and referee when the opportunity comes. After the game, and you may feel that I'm repeating some of the things I've said earlier, wash your hands as soon as possible, leave the facility quickly, take all your possessions with you, any garbage you've created, take with you. Respect the physical distancing guidelines that are in place across the country after the game. Shower at home. Try and go straight home. Have a shower at home and avoid using public showers until we get a little further along in our recovery as a country and a world. Ensure your whistle is sanitized and carry it in a separate container so that it does not cross-contaminate other items. And ensure when you get home that immediately your officiating gear is clean, sanitized and laundered as soon after the game as possible. Considering carrying a laundry bag with you to put anything sweaty that you remove when you leave the gym. And because we're changing at home, obviously this is limited 
but you may choose to remove a sweaty shirt and undershirt and put another cover on top, but try and carry it in a laundry bag and keep it centered until it can be cleaned. Make sure you thank your partner and exit from the facility as soon as practicable. This is all going to be a big change for us when we get out on the court and we're going to all have to work hard and cooperate with each other. Finally, before we open up to questions, please remember the requirements regarding the safe integration of officials must be in place before returning to competition. In this regard, we ensure we encourage local associations or provincial associations, whoever the assigning body is, to make sure that they are clear and know that the safe integration of officials has been addressed by the game owner in the facility, they know how it's going to occur. And in general, physical distancing requirements are going to have to be eased by government, allowing some limited contact before we can play games. Basketball is known and called and described an invasion sport. Contact is inevitable. People and players are going to be in close quarters and we need to be in a place where physical distancing guidelines have been relaxed before we can, we can play. Referees need to be prepared for that changing environment in the gyms, perhaps when you get a, the way you get assignments. It may be that a local association determines that they want to provide you with the waivers and releases that you're going to be asked to assign, sign in advance so you can fill them out at home and take them with you to the gym. It may be in a local association for a tournament. There's a small designated number of officials that are going to be assigned and everybody has those releases waivers ahead of time. So the return to officiating guidelines are provided nearly as guidance as general thoughts of the environment that we can all expect and what referees should anticipate as we return to competition. We certainly cannot answer every question in every situation that will arise, and we do expect these will change as we go forward. We're trying to keep an open line of communication with the provincial presidents and the PTSOs, and hopefully that will help us update these guidelines as we move forward. But critically, if you get an opportunity to referee, have fun, but make safety the number one priority. And finally, before I go to the chat and see what questions we've got, I would encourage you all to make sure the games you're refereeing are being sanctioned through your local governance structure and ensure you are not putting yourself at additional risk by being involved in organizations that are not protected through insurance and you need to ensure you have insurance in place before you go out and referee. Thank you. I'm going to uh, take my screen off of sharing at the moment and then I'll go to the chat for some questions. Okay. So somebody, a uh, gentleman on the call, has asked me what the letters I use constantly throughout this PTSO stand for. So, um, Eric, I'm not sure where you are in the country, but PTSO is your Provincial Territorial Sport Organization. So, in British Columbia, that would be Basketball BC. In Manitoba, that would be Manitoba Basketball. In Ontario, the Ontario Basketball Association. So the provincial territorial sport organizations. So in Canada, every sport has an NSO, an NSO being a national sport organization and every province for the major sports have their own organization and they all flow in a, in a governance structure through that. So hopefully I've answered that question for you. So I have a question that says, with everything that is going on with COVID, why would we not just, just verbal, assume verbally, tell the players to hold on to the ball and the referees not handle the ball at all? Fair question. I don't mean to be trite or rude, 
But if we thought that the real risk was being able to catch something off the ball from short touches on the ball, I'll be honest with you, we should not be refereeing. We should not be out on the floor until we know it is safe to do so. The purpose of having two balls is to provide some additional protection to make sure that they're cleaned and sanitized at all breaks and interchanged. But if we're that concerned that we're going to end up possibly infecting someone by, by touching the ball, um, we, we should not be, we should not be out there refereeing at all. Um, we've got a number of questions coming in and my technology bit, I've probably got to try and find a way to go back up. Uh, sorry, folks, I'm going to try and go back up to a couple of the earlier, earlier questions. So I think there's two questions that, uh, fit together here and I'm kind of, I'm kind of laughing at the second one, but the first, the first question says, are there recommended whistles? The second question is an indication that Fox 40 has a COVID whistle. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. So Fox 40 has done a number of things to provide products that may help in the COVID-19 environment. Fox 40 has produced an electronic whistle. We have tested that electronic whistle and that electronic whistle was used in 26 games during the recently completed CEBL summer series. It is possible we may get to a point where we actually sanction the electronic whistle as the official whistle. But for now, the Fox 40 whistle remains the official whistle of Canada basketball, the official whistle of CBOC, and is the whistle to be used. I will go further on that a little bit. Certainly the electronic whistle approved, uh, uh, proved to be effective in the CBL uh, series. There were some challenges with it without, without any doubt, but I also am aware that Fox 40 is working on an upgraded product and we are waiting for that upgraded product before we make a, a final decision. Fox 40 has also built a couple other products. One is the whistle pouch. The whistle pouch was in the early days being used in the NBA bubble and in the WNBA wobble. And many of you will know that we have a Canadian official from Calgary, Matt Calio, who is in the WNBA wobble. And so we are able to get direct information from Matt. I am waiting for both the whistle pouch um, and the other product I haven't talked about, which is a whistle mask that Fox 40 has developed. Um, they were going to send me the prototypes that they had. Uh, they have been very popular in their sales for them, but additionally, they are improving those products and we're waiting for them uh, to come through. So certainly for the moment, it is much like the question on the ball, if we're really in high danger that somebody is going to transmit COVID-19 through the use of a whistle, and we are talking about refereeing 12 and under basketball, 14 and under basketball, we shouldn't be refereeing. It's not too safe to referee if that's the circumstance. That being said, we're going to do additional work with the electronic whistle, and we may get to a place where it becomes the official whistle. I've got a question around with no jump ball, are we going to use a coin toss? Um, certainly that's something that the local associations and the provincial association would work with, with the PTSO or the organizers of the games, whatever the decision is made. Remember, all you're doing is triggering the first alternating possession process. So whether it's a coin toss, whether it's the visitors, whether it's the home team, once again, in a, in a basketball game played at the U12 and U14 level, this is not a huge, huge deal. Um, some more questions about the electronic whistle. Certainly, we shared the protocol with all the officials that were working at the CEBL. We are not rushing to share that protocol widely at the moment um, because we're looking at the NBA experiment with a pouch as well as, as, well as the fact that it's this question that if we can't distance from the players safely, is it, is it going to be necessary? Um, 
So the question somebody's asked, I've used the word sanitizing throughout the uh, throughout the presentation. And the question is, is sanitizing of the uniform more than washing? Um, in my world, no, but it does mean running the uniform through a, a full cycle in your washer, not just a not just a short rinse or drying it out or whatever. It's a full wash of the uniform. So I have a question that says, how do you deal with a person who has been assigned multiple games back to back on the same day in a tournament? Fair question. I think we all know that this has been an environment that's been consistent across the country, but I do not believe in all honesty, we're going to return to that level of basketball where we're going to be in a position where the same individual is refereeing multiple games um, one after the other during a day. That clearly creates additional risk and should not be happening. Local associations are going to need to work to provide referees with as short a time in the facility as possible. Look, I understand that that could be quite a challenge if we were to return to situations where there were multiple games in facilities all day long. If we get to that stage, gathering restrictions across the country will have been re relaxed significantly from where they are today. In British Columbia, as an example, they remain at 50. So that limits you to a maximum of four teams in that facility before there is a complete cleaning and sanitization of that facility. The numbers are different across the country. Alberta has slightly different numbers. Other provinces have different numbers, but a number of provinces today are still well below 50. So you couldn't be in that particular situation. I apologize. Um, question, can you wear gloves to referee? Yes, you may. If you decide for your own personal safety that you want to wear gloves, not a concern at all. You are welcome to do so. We would not object. Um, so I do have a question that, uh, do we need to leave contact details for contact tracing? Yes, that would be the case. Contact tracing, likely, likely name and phone number. It may well be that they seek an email address as well. And the question is, will the gym be limited to 50 people? Well, that would, that would be depending on the local provincial restrictions. So in British Columbia, that still remains the number. I am aware that it is higher than that in Alberta. So this is why local associations and provincial associations need to be very clear of what the, um, what the conditions are in their local area. So I have a question and I, I will read it as it's written. Is there a sense of who is returning to play? If the questioner doesn't mind, I will carry on. In Ontario, we know that there is no activity for the fall in OFSA and OUA. Is Basketball Ontario sanctioning any play in the fall? So I apologize, I cannot answer for Basketball Ontario. I will say, and I would encourage people to check with the Ontario Officials Association, my understanding is that Ontario basketball is not sanctioning play for the fall and has made the decision that um, in the absence of a significant change, there won't be games till January. I, I can tell the questioner and everybody on the call that this is actually one of my largest worries. We are aware of unsanctioned games being played in certain pockets in the province where some uh, club teams own their own facility and they have arranged competition and had referees come in and referee. We are not aware, and as of, I'm sorry, I'm pausing to think dates in my head. As of last Monday, all of the provincial presidents indicated that they were not uh, sanctioning games or allowing uh, games to be played with referees through associations at that time. But we are aware of games being played in the country, and this is a concern 
where we have referees that may be out officiating that don't have insurance. They have no protection whatsoever. And, and when I say no insurance, not even the normal circumstances you would have had a year ago. It's not just COVID related. And you may find yourself in a position that as an adult in a gym is being played by individuals 12 and under, you could be the individual that's exposed and find yourself in a very awkward situation without any protection. But no, at this time, um, certainly we are aware at the university level across the country, at the junior college level, they have said no conference games until January. Um, I, I happen to be able to see Brad Smith on my screen at the moment, and I can see that Brad is wearing a, something, something yellow and uh, saying hello to me. So I'm gonna to look to see if I can get acknowledgement out of Brad or Brad, you can always pull your mic off. Brad, I believe that I saw um, late last week that in Saskatchewan, there was an announcement that fall sports at the high school level were, I'm gonna use the word suspended and were not going to occur. Uh, that's in Saskatoon, just Saskatoon at the moment. Just Saskatoon, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I'm on a Zoom call, Bill. Um, no, sorry, that's one of my neighbors who's been away and uh, I picked up a bunch of parcels off of his front door that have been sitting there for about a week. So I think he wants them, my apologies. So thank you, Brad. So I knew I had read this weekend. So going back to this question, we know that Saskatoon High School sports has said there will not be fall sports at the moment. Basketball does not fall into fall. I believe it's a winter sport, um, but I think this is the start of communications across the country, and we will start to hear this. Um, I have a question. You suggest to use your voice more than the whistle, but wouldn't COVID be more easily transmitted by speaking, speaking rather than using a whistle? It's a fair question, and I can't answer that medically. What we do know is that with a whistle, you force air, you force the spittle through the whistle, and you're projecting with it. When you're talking to your voice, this is where we know that the, that the, the decisions on two meter safe distancing has come from because the risk is greatly released. So you're not, you're not gonna be having those voice conversations with people at close distance. They're at a greater distance and we believe that it's less risky. Um, I think I've answered the next question, which is around uh, a whistle cover with a pouch or the electronic whistle. I am anxious to see the pouch. I think it's been effective in the NBA games. I'm certainly interested if there's anybody on the call that has been watching the NBA games a little closer than I have in that I actually haven't noticed, um, I haven't noticed the whistle pouch the last couple games I've watched. Maybe I'm just getting used to it. Uh, has anybody on the call noticed that they're no longer using it? Okay, um, question about physical distancing requirements on the bench. So legitimate question, but that is up to the organizers, the provincial or the health people in the region and the guidelines that are set by um, the PTSO or the local organizer. This is not something that the referees will be in uh, a position to enforce or responsible to enforce. It's not a refereeing concern. So I have a question about officials are required to, are all officials required to review all COVID protocols? So I think the question is very specific to the Ontario environment. And I know the Ontario Association of Basketball Officials has been very, very proactive in doing some work around COVID-19. So certainly this presentation does not address what Ontario may address going forward what I would encourage is that officials be aware of what the COVID-19 protocols are uh, in a gymnasium, but it's not your responsibility as an official to ensure that people are adhering to them. So again, the, the questions around um, uh, who may be returning to play, I think we, that's been asked. Um, I do have a question. Can we wear a visor during the game? 
So once again, like the gloves, if you chose to wear a visor during the game, in the early days, this is something you would look to your local association or your provincial association for guidance on. We would not object to an official wearing a visor as long as you're willing to communicate. An interesting question around, are any and all subs expected to sanitize before entering the game? I'll be honest with you. On the first version of the plan we wrote, we actually had that included in the plan. And we were suggesting that a substitute that comes in uses hand sanitizer before they come in. What became clear is that actually went outside of our role as referees. And it went out of uh, making sure we were operating in a safe manner and following all the protocols. Certainly that's something we would support, but we would look for the local organizer to have made those arrangements if in their, um, uh, if in their uh, world um, they feel that that's something necessary. It is really critical folks to understand that this is a huge country and the environment across the country can be very different and can be very different minute to minute. And in the very largest provinces, and let's be honest, of our 10 provinces, six or seven, depending on your paradigm, can be considered large. And the circumstances in those provinces can be very different. So it's something we must be aware of. Um, I've been asked about the slides being available to the local boards. Um, I can make the slides available through the provincial presidents and have them shared that way. I will do that if the provincial presidents are interested. I will say that I would really encourage anybody that is asking about the slides to actually take the time and acquire the full plan and have a look at the full plan and understand it. And so a question that's been asked is, wouldn't the allocator have our contact information I'm a little leery of leaving my info with a coach. Fair point. I would not expect that it is a coach that is looking after the contact tracing. This should be the organizer of that game, of that league, or of that competition. The information is there for your safety. And if the local health officers require that information for contact tracing, it is like going out to a restaurant to eat. If you don't want to leave your name and phone number when you go into a restaurant, your choice, you don't have to. Much in the same way, if you choose that you don't want to leave it there, you don't have to go and referee. The point being made is an interesting one that says, wouldn't the allocator have our contact information? Yes, the allocator should. And this is where circumstances that have occurred regularly at the local level, where somebody may hand a game off to another official, or the allocator has a group of officials going to a site, is just not going to be acceptable. As a local association, as an assigner, you are going to have to know clearly who is assigned to every game and who worked every game. So to the questioner, valid question, you do get that information, um, but we anticipate if contact tracing is a requirement of the local health authorities, that will be a requirement for anybody entering the gym. Um, valid point, I've said regularly that I expect lower levels to play first, but schools may not allow outside groups to use their gym. Absolutely. I agree with the individual, this will be a challenge. The individual is suggesting, so wouldn't higher level, better funded programs return first? In all honesty, I understand your point, but if you do feel that the higher levels are better funded, I'm going to suggest to you that that's not the case. We've already seen the University of Alberta, one of the largest schools in the country, cancel all, I, I need a word, uh, uh, sport programs, all of their, their outside extracurricular uh, interscholastic programs have been canceled because they're not uh, able to, uh, to fund those programs. 
So we're about 56 minutes in. Um, I'm just going to glance down at a couple more questions and uh, go from there. Um, yeah, somebody, somebody's asked the question, we're allowing people to wear gloves. I would suggest some guidance around that and the hazards that go along with wearing them. No question. I can tell you in the early days, the CEBL considered having officials wear gloves. At the end of the day, they decided it was better not to have the officials wear gloves. If you choose to wear gloves, you accept all responsibility that then comes with the risk that goes with wearing those gloves. And I have confirmation that uh, the whistle pouch is still being used in the WNBA. Okay. And I have a question that I've been asked and answered previously. Um, uh, will there be plexiglass around the scorer's table? I think this relates an awful lot to the question around better funded programs. As most programs are a visitor into a facility, I do not honestly believe we're going to see a situation where programs can afford plexiglass around the scorer's table. It may be where we end up if we're a year from now before there's any games, but it's not something I anticipate. Okay. So a question has been asked, what is our responsibility when it comes to fights or physical confrontation on the floor? Nothing changes as referees. If you have an opportunity to stop that altercation from happening, you should take the opportunity to stop that altercation from happening. But you don't carry the responsibility for that altercation uh, on the floor. Yes, you need to do everything you can to stop that altercation from proceeding, but you're not going to go in and put yourself in a bad health situation. Okay, so effectively, the guidelines that we've provided are simply that, and I emphasize the word guidelines. It is really up to the local associations and the provincial associations to work with the people they service, with the provincial and territorial sport organizations to put into place the conditions that exist within their local environment. And if we've ever thought as human beings that we need to be flexible, as we move to a transition, we're going to be, have to be more flexible than we've ever been as human beings to adjust much as we have in all of our lives for the last I'm lost now. Are we at four and a half months? Is that generally where we are in this circumstance? So I certainly want to thank everybody um, for being on today. Uh, I will make these slides available within the next week to the provincial presidents and the provincial presidents can determine how they wish to share them. But again, I will encourage everybody to have a look at the broader protocol that is available on game plan, the entire plan and understand it. Thank you kindly, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure and uh, I wish you all safe health and be well. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike.